Hey guys, uh, so I'm making a poker video because honestly I feel a bit bad that I've left people to hang dry and loose to fend for yourselves when I said that I was going to be there and I, I will be there. It's just um, happenstance has gone in a way that I did not predict. Hannah and I are currently in Austria. We have to spend more time here than I thought because we're traveling with a cat called Rune. I'll show you a little video of him here if my editor's any good. Where you go? Where you go? Oh no, there it is! <laughs> there are some weird laws and regulations about how long uh, you have to leave before you travel with a cat after he gets his vaccinations and go to certain countries. There are little loopholes you have to do. It's real complicated and boring stuff. But I am going to cater to the masses and people have asked me to outline exactly how they would go about labeling different people and what's the optimal strategy to do that because I think a lot of people have seen in my bankroll challenge me go pretty ham on the the labeling mechanism and in my opinion it's a super super effective strategy um, but you have to be doing it with a lot of mindfulness and a lot of consciousness and a lot of very strategic thinking um, there are so many little parts to poker like like the labeling, like bankroll management, like whether to run it twice, like shit like that, that really they seem like very easy things to to deal with like when you first look at them, but the deeper and deeper you go into the thought of how to do them, the more complex you see these issues become because poker itself is just a complex thing. So lots of the tangents that go away from it are also very complex. So do not underestimate, in my humble opinion, any of these tangential matters to poker. All of them need to need to be added together to make you a successful poker player. Just a, a little update. My bankroll challenge is still hella on. Thank you for everyone that's been asking and uh, been supporting in the comments and sending me messages. It's real nice. And people saying they've hugely improved their win rates and their careers just you know really started in a way that it hasn't done for years before. And I love those kind of messages, guys. Absolutely love it. Always smile, always reading about the Hannah. And uh, it's just, it's it's awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm currently in Austria. I, I, I might, I might start doing vlogs because there's just so much beautiful scenery around and I have so much I want to say, but I'm not really near a computer, so I can't really say it. Like loads of poker stuff, loads of life stuff. And uh, if you don't want to hear about that kind of stuff, don't bother clicking on it. You fucking negative YouTube commenters. Anyway, so labeling guys, it's hella important. And I'm, I'm just gonna go through the labeling system that I use, um, but there are also different other labeling systems that people can use. But in my opinion, the one that I've got is probably the best. So the one, the labeling system I use is I have a few categories for different types of regs. I have cash game regs um, because they play very differently to to tournament regs, especially the high stakes cash game regs, are very very GTOE. They know they know a lot more moves. They're not afraid to put chips in the middle in comparison to tournament regs. I have a good reg and I have an average reg and I have a, a super reg. And uh, these are all really important because, and I'll, I'll use an example that I may have mentioned before, but it's the first one that's coming to my mind now. Is that when I was having a conversation with Greg Merson and we were talking about over betting on the turn, and I remember saying, yeah, I would only do it as bluff versus recreational play. I would only do it for value versus kind of medium to bad to, to good regs. And then I balance the hell out of it against super regs, the people that are actually paying attention to that. And he was like, that is exactly what I do. And it really goes to show that you have to be adjusting to the type of player you believe your opponent to be. And yeah, you might get that wrong. And that's really, really crucial to, to understand. Yeah, you're kind of playing guessing game about their tendencies, but you have to be real good at guessing. You're not just gonna be like, well, I'm not gonna get 100% right. I might as well give up and play GTO. We do not want to be that kind of person. Trust me, it's not gonna be good for your career in the long run, 99.999% of the time. It's not gonna be helpful for your creativity and your ways of thinking. We do not want to say anything but fuck GTO when we're talking about that topic. So the more important part of the labeling system that I use is the labeling the fun players part, the recreational part. The Bitch. Don't like using that word, it's derogatory, it's pejorative, it's, uh, it's it's not good. But here is why it's important. The differences in how professionals play comparison to each other is a load smaller than the differences that recreational players play towards each other. The amount that you can exploit professional players is a lot less than the amount you can exploit recreational players. So those two factors together, and I'm gonna let you work out why, add up to you wanting 
to be able to label with more nuance the recreational player and with more consistency and putting more time you only have a set amount of labels that you can use yeah you can add your own but it starts getting real complicated if you start doing that um, i've added maybe three or four more in, um, plus the the normal colors that poker stars uses by the way party poker if you're watching get a better way of being able to label people i never ever label people on party poker it's just such like you have to like click on them and click on the box and click on the thing then click off the th it's just a nightmare better than it used to be but it's still a nightmare um, but on Pokestars, it's, it's, it's pretty easy. First label I'm going to mention, Undefined Fish. It's a nice lilac color that I use. Undefined Fun Player, sorry. And this means that someone has done something extremely, let's use the word fishy. Um, they've done something bad, particularly bad, or they have done something to present themselves as probably a fun player. So let, let's give an example if you're playing live, not that you use labeling systems live, but you, you subconsciously label someone live. You, you, you play someone live, they sit down, it's like a 40 year old dude in like super like bling watches, he's playing 100K and he picks up his cards like this. He's looking at his cards like... You know, heart starts pounding. <laughs> it's, uh, that's uh, what we like to call an unidentified fun player with aces. So now let's bring that onto the online felt. You can look at someone who is doing something quite fishy, like having less or fewer than 100 big blinds in their stack. And the reason why this is a uh, quite a, a recreational-esque thing to do is because most, the vast, vast majority of professionals, they don't want to play short stacks. They want to have as much money on the table as possible because then they can win more money against other people, assuming they have an edge against those people, which professionals do believe vast, vast, vast majority of the time they do against the people they're playing against. So when I see someone with 56 big blinds, I automatically think, okay, 98 8% of the time that's going to be a recreational player, maybe 99 if you're playing the micro sticks. So I, I label him unidentified. And here, here's one of the things you need to know, like, yeah, you can be wrong about this. Yeah, it could be a reg that's forgot to put auto rebuy on or he's just like new to the site and it's new settings. You always have to keep in mind that the label you're using might be wrong and you have to be willing to deviate from that and not just get stuck into your first read on the situation of like, oh, this guy's a fish. So fuck him, he's always a fish. Like, yeah, okay, you might label someone as a recreational player or a fun player when they have 50 big blinds, but then you might, over the course of 3,000 hands against them, see their plan just like a super, super good strategy. You might have to readjust your label. So it's really, it's an intuitive process. It's not a science, as uh, it's not purely a science anyway, as most of poker tends not to be, um, but it is extremely helpful. And um, here, here's another reason actually why it's really helpful to, to have people labeled at quite a high frequency and the reason I do it with with less accuracy than some people at higher frequency is because when you're on a table for instance and you, you're thinking okay do I open ace do suited under the gun in the six max cash game you look around you see five tough regs that may be better than you you're like all right I'm out I'm out muck it get out of there but you see five recreational players and you're fist pump open in that and you can't underestimate how much this this is important over a long period of time. It's hella important. So knowing who's like on the button, knowing who's in the big blind, knowing all these different things, it's really, really important. Plus, let's say you get three bet by the button and he's got a recreational player label. Okay, 95% of the time he's a recreational player and he's three betting button versus under the gun, it means he rarely, rarely, rarely is bluffing unless we have like a specific recreational player because most recreational players don't bluff versus under the gun three betting. It's a lot, there's a lot of nuance and these are only two very small examples and you, the more you play, the more you'll understand all of these different nuances and all, all these different examples. So then let's go further than that. I got light blue. This is an aggro recreational player. Uh, I think what, what I got it on at the moment is called he loves it. And when they love it, it means they love it, usually in a lot of different ways. Usually if someone's aggressive pre-flop, they're also aggressive post-flop. If that's not the case, you can make a note in the middle, um, but it's very, very, very often the case. So when they have a he loves it label, what do you do? You, you tighten your range versus them, or maybe you widen if they're they're gonna be defending the big blind, so you might open wider on the button because you have more implied odds. If you have a top pair, you might stack them. Um, you tighten your, your range or you, you, you widen your range in certain situations, like if you, you have an ace queen on the cutoff and he three bets the button, you might four bet ace queen and try and get it all in because you've seen him do crazy things before. All of these different adjustments, they really do, they can make huge, huge, huge adjustments just based on that one label. And yes, again, you might be wrong about it, but most of the time the mathematics is just gonna 
work in your favor because you know, say you're, you're right 95% of the time, even 85% of the time, getting an ace queen, cut off versus button against an angro maniac is going to be super profitable. Whereas you would never do that against a, a, a reg 100 big blinds deep in a cash game. Next, I have uh, dark blue. I have hey, hey, station A or something, some, something along those lines. So it's a calling station, basically. Someone, someone that doesn't like to let go of their hands. Um, you can have someone that's a calling station pre-flop and post-flop. Um, it's very good to be able to note distinctly which one you've seen if you do see it um i'd say calling stations specifically it's good to have that nuance between pre and post because some people are huge stations pre but then they give up their hands post which is like beautiful just leaking money over to the poker community and some people can, they can be relatively tight pre but as soon as they hit top pair then they go and ham shout out to american regs this is a really 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 good note to have on someone because then you know if you have you know bottom set and you can just like see bet pot or see bet 2x pot and again and again and just shove the river in where you would have to usually go like two thirds two thirds two thirds and this is where a huge amount of your win rate is going to come from from the calling stations because when you beat them when you're exploiting them it's by stacking them whereas if you're exploiting like just a passive recreational player which i'll get in get onto after this it's usually by just like c-bending the turn a bit wider so calling stations they're the ones you really want to open wider on you want to you want to try and find excuses to get in pots don't go ludicrous don't don't you know start four betting six five six six three suited or anything like that always make sure that you're not you're not going absolutely insane but do try and find excuses to to get in pots of them as long as you're you're not really pushing the boat out too far. The things that you can look out for to label some calling station, maybe they, they peel like king five off in the small line, something like that. You can, you can probably call them a station. Maybe they peel like, you know, jack five suited button versus under the gun. You can definitely call them a calling station for that. Or, and then you leave, label like pre-flop calling station, or just say like put a note, just like flat jack five suited versus under the gun, which is what I usually do. Or you can, you can label a calling station and say like, okay, couldn't fold second pair in a spot where I'm never bluffing. You know, that that kind of thing. I've seen a lot of professionals try and put like really, really specific hand histories as a note, but you don't want to be doing that. I really disagree. I think I heard Phil Galfon say that once. I I don't think people have enough time, especially when they're just like, you know, four tabling Zoom or whatever to read through a whole hand history, then extrapolate the information and then make inferences. And then you just want to be like, you want to keep it clear and concise, but you want to make sure that it's an important note that you can actually use in the future. So flat jack five suited versus under the gun, you know he has a wide range post. Can't fold second pair, you know that you can value back bottom set or top pair, top kicker real big. Any Something like that. Okay, so next let's think about it. I've got passive recreational player. Um, I wish I remember what I called all these people. Someone let me know in the comments. They are a particular type of player where they are not going to be bluffing very often. Uh, they tend not to. Th this is a label that I get wrong more often than, than other labels just because you'll see someone just like check down to the river with like, you know, the best bluffing hand they could possibly have and, and an amazing bluff spot and they're just like giving up. So sometimes you can call them passive recreational player. But then it might just be because they're in, they're in a scared mood and then next time they decide to blast off because they're tilted. So passive recreational players, I, I definitely have um, a, like a mental note that I'm more lenient towards not exploiting that as hard and not, not making as big enough adjustments. Um, another thing would be, you know, if they're limping loads, then it could be like passive pre-flop. If it's just like limp corning, ace king, cutoff versus button, that's pretty passive pre-flop. You can make some, like some really specific notes about that. And then you, you can also split passiveness into like passive calling station or passive um, like person that folds. I usually use passive recreational players as people that fold a lot because calling station is a, a specific one. But it's up to you, whichever one kind of works best with the way that you you do this. And the best way to do it is just experiment with this. So I think that's all of the different kind of recreational players that I would use. And then I have, okay, so let, let me just clarify for people playing the microsakes. I have all these different labels for, for professionals. I would not advise you to do that if you're playing like 5 and L. Don't have like a super reg and a reg and an average reg. Like just put all the regs as the same thing. The reason that I think it's good to do it in the high stakes is because there's such a big difference and there's such like a unique way that like a super reg will play and a, a cash game reg will play. Whereas it's really hard to predict how a professional at 5 and L is going to play. And I don't think you can summarize that with just a note. I think you just have to homogenize all of regs 
within within the micro stakes and small stakes communities um, as just a reg and then just make unique notes for that person. And th this is why I'm putting more emphasis on the recreational players in the video. It's real hard to exploit people at the micro stakes by just calling them a, a you know, good reg or an okay reg. Um, but you can just mean, it, it does mean like if you're opening the button, there are two regs in the big lines and small lines, then you can open type. You know, it's, it's, it's still very useful to have, but it's it's not something that I use as leniently, like vast, vast, vast majority of my notes. So recreational players like undefined, I always got less than 100 big blinds, I always limps the, the cutoff. So that's another example, by the way. Someone limps the cutoff, you can call them a recreational player. And maybe this will cause some meta things where people start limping the cutoff just to try and get those tags. I don't know what's gonna go down, but as of when I'm saying this, 99% of the, the cutoff limits, probably even more, are done by recreational players. So we'll see what happens in the future. Apparently people have started adjusting their play real hard. And like, I've had loads of people report that the micro stakes plays super differently now. Um, now they've seen me do the bankroll challenge, which I love, I love hearing that shit because, and don't worry, it's not just killing the micro stakes. There's gonna be so much more and that I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it my very, very hardest. I'm, I'm real confident about this one. I'm gonna bring so many more new people into poker in the most ethical way I possibly can. That will be to do it at my training site, offering them alternatives. And I've got loads of plans for that. And I really wanna try and like flump out, the, <laughs> flump out the ethics of how to get people into poker. I've got some really good ideas about that. Um, anyway, there's just a lot of exciting stuff coming up my charity if anyone's curious is also coming up that should be up and alive and well sooner than my training site but they're both going to be around the same time maybe in three to six months and uh i can't wait to share it with you guys there's so many exciting things guys if you want to share if you want to check out my charity i've got a video called a summary of abundance it's literally going to change the fucking world i'm not even joking about that i'm not being i Maybe I'm being biased, but I don't think I'm being biased. It's so exciting. Blockchain is the future. Blockchain is going to change the world in so many ways. And I'm at the forefront of it. And oh my God, there's so many other people at the forefront of doing amazing things around the world, curing, solving all of these world crises. <sighs> Can't wait. Can't wait, guys. Anyway, peace out. And uh, let me know if you have any questions about this kind of stuff. Like the video. I always forget to say this. And like the video subscribe and hit the notification bell yeah youtuber now thought so and love each other guys be kind be positive and be happy because at the end of all of this who cares if you're a crushing poker player making millions if you're if you're still a miserable bastard and they exist try not to leave too many negative comments in the in in the youtube things guys because i'm not i'm not gonna get angry and be like fuck you for saying that you're so i can't believe you're saying that but as a genuine, unconditional, loving thing from from me to, to all those negatrons out there. I really, really don't want people to be negative towards me, not really because it affects me, because it doesn't too much, but because that negativity that you fire out to, to the rest of the world, it comes back to you in ways you cannot imagine. And if you want people to be miserable around you, you want people to say bad things about you, and you want people to judge you, and you want people to to reciprocate ne negativity and you want to bring in more negative people into your world, then okay, do your thing. If that's what you want, fuck it, I don't mind. But if you want people to to like you, pe want people to listen to you, want people to laugh at you, laugh with you, sorry. You want people to be kind to you, you want people to fall in love with you, you want people to want to be friends with you, want to be around you, want to hear what you have to say, then positivity is the way. Don't be naive about it. Don't just be like, love everyone. You can't, gotta be strong, gotta be stern, gotta be like, fuck that guy if he's doing bad things. We don't judge him, but we don't wanna be near him. But we're gonna say nice things about him because we're not gonna sit here and be like, oh, we're better than him because that shit just Im leaves an imprint on his soul or if you wanna call it a psyche, then whatever you wanna call it anyway. Need just to get that out of my system. Peace. Oh, guys.